we're picking up with Act 2, my goal today is to get through 2 and 3, and then we'll finish 4 and 5 on Tuesday, and that'll have us essentially one day behind where I want to be. If we get farther than that uh, today, we will. We're going to skip almost all of the comical comedic scenes. Um, <coughs> It's not that they're not important. Um, it's we're skipping them one time. I've run out of time, and two. They don't bear the brunt of the meaning of the play. They add to it. They emphasize some things, but the real meat of the play is is found largely in the conversations between the king and how between Prince John and the conspirators, uh, Northumberland, his daughter-in-law, wife, etc., cetera, and among the conspirators. So that's, that's where we're gonna focus. Um, so, very briefly, in, um, in Act Two, Scene One, like I said, we're going to skip most of it other than just to say the important part here is the interaction between the Chief Justice and Falstaff. Okay? We're going to see as the play progresses, especially in Act 5, I'm going to give away a little bit of the ending, after the king has died, let me rephrase that, after Henry IV has died, because as soon as Henry IV is dead, there's a new king. And in the body of the text, that king is not referred to as King Henry V, it's just king. Okay, so you have to just bear in mind, once Henry IV is gone, whenever you get king after that, that's Henry V. And the reason this, this little interchange between the Chief Justice and Falstaff here is important is keep in mind what the Chief Justice's job is. This is not like Chief Justice John Roberts of the Supreme Court. This Chief Justice is like the Attorney General. It is his job to make sure all the laws are faithfully executed. Right? The Supreme Court, our Supreme Court Chief Justice, ultimately has no power. If you, if you look at the Constitution, as an example, getting a little bit off here, but it's okay. What power does the Supreme Court have? That's its function, okay? It hears cases and decides whether or not they are constitutional or not. What power does it have to enforce that? Zero. None. It has absolutely <coughs> no power to enforce its decisions. Where does the power come to enforce the decisions? It's the executive branch, it's Article Two. Article One, if I remember, is legislative, Article Two is executive, Article Three is the judicial. It is up to the president and the executive branch to do what? Faithfully execute the laws of the country. If the president were to decide, any president, and some have, were to decide not to enforce the laws the Supreme Court, power-wise, can't do anything. It can say that the president is acting unconstitutionally, in which case you have a constitutional crisis, because that then brings in the legislative branch to do what? What is its power against the president? It's only one power, impeachment, okay? So the way the Constitution is written, it's predicated on this kind of agreement among the three bodies that they will act in concert for the common welfare, you know, all that kind of stuff. This Chief Justice, he does have power. He does have authority. He can do what? He can call the troops. He can call the guards. So when he has this little interchange in 2-1 between himself and Falstaff, he, one, he's telling Falstaff what he ought to be doing. He's supposed to be with Prince John and some other stuff. But he also calls Falstaff to the carpet 
because of how he's treating um, the whore, essentially, in the tavern. He says at one point, uh, lines 111 and following, you have, 112, you have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. Purse is essentially saying you've robbed her. He hasn't literally robbed her. He's borrowed money from her. And he's not paid back. So the Chief Justice <coughs> is addressing that, and he's also addressing his sexual use of this woman. That is, you forced yourself, essentially, on her, all right? And the hostess says, this is Mistress Quickly, if I remember correctly, called Derek very simple. She says, yea, in truth, like, preach it, brother. <laughs> That's exactly what he's done. <coughs> so he tells her to be quiet. So he tells Falstaff, pay her the debt you owe her. And the next line is really, or next half of the sentence is really strange when you think about it. And unpay the villainy you have done her. Okay? The one, pay the debt, you may do with sterling money. Sterling money. Wow. Sterling money. That is, pay her in sterling. And the second, the villainy he has done her, how can he repay her that? With current repentance. What does current repentance mean? And then we're going to go on to the next scene. Immediate? What about the repentance? What does rep repentance always, 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 always require? You got to stop. You stop what you're doing, the thing you're repenting of. In other words, stop using her. Stop abusing her right now. Does that unpay? Does that unrape? Does that un... No, it doesn't, obviously. But it doesn't continue it, okay? So, that's important because what has Falstaff been to Hal from the beginning of Henry IV Part One, seemingly to now? He's been that, you know, the jovial companion, the one Hal's been having all this fun with. Well, as the play continues, especially when we get to Act 5, what we're going to see is Falstaff gets replaced by the Chief Justice. When Falstaff gets replaced by the Chief Justice, part of that is because Hal's father is dead. And Chief Hal's going to say these words, you shall be as a father to me. In other words, a guide, a director. You, you will be my moral compass, so to speak. Okay? Remember one of the things we talked about with, with the first play. Hal's first soliloquy is all about putting on this act, right? He's got these clouds all around him. Why? So that when he comes from behind the clouds, everybody's going to look to him with wondrous eyes, and they're going to be amazed at his reformation. And one of the things we're seeing through here, through this play, is that reformation isn't shining so clearly. At the end of Act 5, it's still not totally proven. All right? It's getting there. People have more faith, more belief, not religious faith, but you know, belief, loyalty in hell. But you know, there are there's still some doubts to it. All right? Act two, scene two. Um, we're not gonna spend much time on this one. Just a couple of things. So we have Hal come in with pawns. You can call them points, pawns, pawn, whatever. Um, and Hal says in the middle of his first longish speech, 9, 10, or 11, what a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name or to know thy face tomorrow. Now, he's saying that kind of jokingly. Yet there's an undercurrent. Again, if the world were a perfect place, we would do Henry V and all the other and all the other plays, but it's not. 
the reason this is important is because it's, it's kind of foreshadowing something we're going to see in Henry V. And in Henry V, Hal essentially has turned his back on all his old friends. Peto, Bardolph, Quans, Falstaff. Falstaff dies in Henry V. Hal's not there for his death. He mourns, kind of, but it's kind of like, yeah, those were the good old days, but you know, now I've got a kingdom to run. Okay? So they continue talking. And he alludes to, or he refers to tennis. Okay. Henry V opens, eh, not quite opens, very early on in Henry V, we have tennis balls. So Shakespeare is linking right now this play with the later play. Or he picks up this idea from this play as he's writing Henry V. And in the tennis balls thing in the next play, it's you know the Dauphin of France, the Prince of France, sends Hal a box of tennis balls. He's essentially saying, you're a fluff. Go play with these balls, little boy while I defeat England in France. This is during the Hundred Years' War, right? And Hal's like, Prince, excuse me, King Henry V is like, give this word back to the Dauphin. I shall return his serve. And so Shakespeare uses a tennis metaphor in such a way that you know, it will shake the walls of the king and all that kind of stuff. So, Hal and, and Quans go on. Um, beginning round, round lines 37 and following. They talk about Hal's father being sick. And the reason they're talking about that is because Hal's, he's kind of feeling Quans for what will the people, the common people, the everyday ordinary people, think if I show sorrow for my father's illness? Okay? He says, 37, 38, Mary, I tell thee, it is not meet that appropriate that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell to thee, as to one it pleases me, for fault of a better, to call my friend, I could be sad. And sad indeed. That is, inside, like we're going to hear Hamlet talk about, this woe that's inside. Hal is saying, I really am sad. Right? So, how? Thou thinks me as far in the devil's book as thou in Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Obduracy, stubbornness, and persistency, he's talking about persistency in that stubbornness. But what stubbornness? He's talking about actions. The whoring, the carousing, the gaining, all that kind of stuff. You think I'm just like you in false stuff. Let the end try the man. What does that mean? Try means prove. Let the end of one's life, what? Be the proof. How one dies, Hal is saying, is what's important. Okay? How did Hotspur die? Valiantly. Okay, he fought for the wrong side. But he died valiantly. That's why Hal offers praise to him, even though he was a rebel. One can praise one's enemies. We have this mindset that today... That is essentially, if you have an enemy, let's say country, nation to nation, militarily, you can't praise that enemy in any way. Look at, the, just as an example, look at how most of the government of the United States refers to Vladimir Putin. Okay? Look how the United States referred to Hitler 
while Hitler was alive, while Hitler was running Germany, okay? Or even now, how we refer to Hitler. Hitler was evil, right? Egomaniac, mass murderer, you know, blah, 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 okay? Was Hitler for the German people, don't get me wrong, okay? <laughs> I don't want this to be misconstrued. I can just hear the headlines. Was Hitler, for the German people, a bad leader? No, why not? He raised Germany out of the depression before any other Western country. How did he do that? By building his military. He put people back to work. That was smart. I mean, militarily, economically, that was smart. All the other stuff he did, bad, evil, okay, don't. How sane, you gotta judge someone by their end. So, so let's look at Hitler. <laughs> How'd he end? Pretty much anybody who ends with a bullet in their head, self-administered, not a good ending, all right? But I tell thee, so let the end try and prove the man, but I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. Why does it bleed inwardly? Because like Hamlet is going to say, break, break my heart, or I must hold my tongue. He can't express it publicly. Why? It's what they talk about next. Because everyone will think he's a hypocrite. Why would they think he's a hypocrite? How does he spend his days? That first long speech between Prince Hal and King Henry IV in the first play. Anybody remember it? What? They said they don't know him anymore. We don't know you. You've lost your place in the council. It's been months. Your little brother has taken your position. Little little negative tinge to that, by the way. If you know anything about English history, what do little brothers sometimes do? They off big brothers and take their position. Again, Hamlet. Claudius is the younger brother to Hamlet Sr. He kills his brother and takes his throne, okay? So, in keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. Uh, all he means by ostentation? Portrayal. Pause. Why? Why? Why don't you let the people know? What would you think of me if I did? What would you think of me if I wept? I, I would think you're a hypocrite. A princely hypocrite. Why? Because you're a prince. That's, that's all that's meant there. It would be every man's thought. In other words, he's suggesting everyone would think what about Hal? Don't say that he's a hypocrite. Why would it be hypocritical? What? There's a deeper meaning being suggested there. Oh, come on. What you really want is for your father to die. Because? Then he becomes king. And what he does, then essentially is kingly. People didn't call Richard a hypocrite. When hip Richard, as he's called in one of the plays, the gambling fool, not G-A-M-B-L-I-N-G, G-A-M-B-O-L-I-N-G, dancing, tripping around, etc. Okay? Hamlet, uh, Henry, Prince. And thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man stopped in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me a hypocrite indeed. And what excites, what causes your worshipful thought, Hamlet's being, sorry, Hal is being a little bit sarcastic there, to think so. Why would we think you're a hypocrite? Because you've been lewd. <laughs> And engraft to Falstaff. What does it mean to be engraft? To be grafted onto. To be grafted onto. He is saying, 
Franz is saying, false death is more your father than Henry IV. And to you, <laughs> that is ungrafted to you. So if the populace thinks he's engrafted to Falstaff, and let's extrapolate, in Pwans, in Bardolph, in Pedo, what will Hal have to do at some point? He'll have to prune them off. Okay. Jump to 2 3. So, this says Workworth, you're seeing direction at the bottom, says it's at Workworth, Workworth before Northumberland's castle. I literally have no idea where Workworth is. Northumberland's castle is Annick, A-L-N-W-I-C-K, castle. So I, I, I don't, it's got to be in Shakespeare, that's why it would be there, okay? So Northumberland comes in. With, <coughs> with his wife, Lady Northumberland, and the wife to Harry Percy, Lady Percy. If, if Harry Percy had lived and Lord Northumberland had died, Harry Percy would have become Northumberland. That's how the system works, okay? So, Northumberland addresses his daughter-in-law and says, wife and daughter, I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, give even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times, and be like them to Percy troublesome. He's kind of saying, don't come to me with all these troubles. He's not talking about household, family troubles. He's talking about the troubles in the kingdom. Okay? Lady Northumberland says, I've, I've given up. I've given over. I will speak no more. I'm not going to talk to you about what are the troubles of these times? What is the state still in? There's some disarray. Has the rebellion been vanquished? Not at all. Okay? Do what you will. Sounds like my wife. You know, I know you're going to do whatever you want, even though you ask for my advice. You're still not going to listen to me. That's what she's saying. Okay? Northumberland, alas, sweet wife, my honor is at pawn. I've pawned my honor. What's he saying? I've got to get it back. What's his only way of getting it back? I've got to enter the fray. I have to leave my troops. Okay? And but my going, unless I go. There's no way I can get it back, okay? Remember, his son died for honor, essentially. So Lady Percy then speaks, Hotspur's wife. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. Notice, she's not saying to her father-in-law, Oh, dearest father-in-law, go redeem your honor and your dead son's honor. Well, at least in that line she didn't. The time was, Father, that you broke your word, when you were more endeared to it than now. You owed more to your word then. When was the then? When your son needed you. <laughs> Battle of Shrewsbury. You gave your word that you would lead your troops, and you didn't show up. When your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, threw many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. And it's almost like, I mean, you, I think you could do an interesting version of the play where you use mass media, like on a screen in the background. And she says this, and on the screen behind, you have Hotspur at the Battle of Shrewsbury with his men getting slaughtered, looking, and he sees his father with a mass of troops, or excuse me, he sees his father's mass of troops and his father lying in bed ill, like, come on, Dad, get up. 
come, come to us. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? What is she possibly suggesting? Why did he stay? He was sick. He was sick. What might she be suggesting? Yeah. You weren't so sick that you couldn't lead your troops into battle. There were two honors lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. In other words, you can get a cloth and you can shine up that armor still. You can buff off that tarnishing for his hot spurs. Mm. It stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven and by his light, that is Hotspur's light, did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. All the chivalry, all the knighthood. She's not referring to just Hotspur's troops. She's saying Hotspur spurred on the, the rebellious troops also the kings. Why? If Hotspur hadn't led those troops into battle, the king's troops wouldn't have been led into battle. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. Glass, the mirror. We're going to have Ophelia talk about Hamlet. That he was the form and glass of the age. And what she means by that is he's the model. Okay? He's the epitome of what a knight is. Shakespeare may have in mind, by the way, here for this depiction of Hotspur, an author he probably knew, Sir Philip Sidney, okay? who died in 1588. Um, who was widely regarded as the greatest knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, of the age. He wrote a series of sonnets called Astor Phil and Stella. He wrote the greatest, up until John Milton, he wrote the greatest defense of literature called the defense of poesy or the, uh, a defense for English poetry um, where he's arguing against censorship. I said until John Milton, because then John Milton writes Areopagitica in the 1640s, which is the greatest defense of, against censorship ever. Sidney died, like I said, pretty sure it's 1588. He had volunteered, led a series, led some Protestant troops against the Spanish on the continent. And he, what was it? I think he had a musket wound in the thigh. And it took him like weeks to die. When he died, it's almost fair to say that literally, it is figuratively, but all Europe mourned. I mean, there were, there were praises for him in all the countries because he was the perfect courtier. He was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth. In fact, he was punished by Queen Elizabeth because she, he told her not to marry Philip of Spain. He was like 21 when he told her that. It's a rather gutsy move. She banished him from court for a while. He was the greatest horseman. He was the greatest swordsman. He wrote poetry. He was a great singer, apparently, and he was pretty good on his feet. Those were all the, night, all the characteristics of a knight. You can write poetry, you can sing well, you can play the lute, you can ride a horse, you can shoot an arrow, you knew sword play, you were great, courageous, and he was all of that, okay? That's Hotspur, essentially. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. Everybody wanted to look like him. He had no legs that practiced not his gait. That is, people walked like Hotspur, in speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, that is, he spoke with a northern accent. Read Chaucer. Chaucer makes fun 
of northern accents. Okay? Because it's not classy. Shakespeare probably spoke a somewhat northwest midlands, a Warwickshire dialect. It was not London dialect. Now, he might have spoken more London dialect by the time he died, but when he would have gotten to London, it would have been, you know, like being in Washington, D.C. and hearing somebody from Woodbury talk, or North Alabama if you want. And you immediately know that person's not from around these parts, right? And we can see that in Shakespeare's plays and sonnets and poems. We can see his Warwickshire dialect at work, use of words and things like that. What else? Speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, that is, he couldn't help that because he was born in Northumberland. And again, Northumberland's on the border of Scotland. So we're talking almost like a Scots dialect. Became the accents of the valiant. People mimicked his speech. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass copy and book. That is the book one would copy from that fashioned others. In him, skip everything between the brackets, uh, between the dashes, him did you leave. Now, do you really think Northumberland needs to be reminded of this? <clears throat> Second to none, unseconded by you. What does unseconded mean? Keep going. I mean, th that's true. It's, it's a very specific term. In the British duel system, as in dueling, when you agree to a duel, somebody stands as your second. In the Harry Potter novels, Harry's going to meet one night against Malfoy. And Ron says, I'll be your second. Harry doesn't have a clue what it means until Ron explains. That means either if you don't show up or you die, that other person steps in. Usually it's more of the if you don't show up. Okay. In um, when, which poem? In Sir Longfall, or Longball, depending on which version, when Longball gets in trouble with the queen and has to um, stand trial, essentially, Sir Gowan becomes, he, they don't use the term second there because it's not the, it hasn't, um, that terminology hasn't been adopted yet. Sir Gowan becomes his guarantee. That is, Sir Gowan, if Sir Longfall doesn't show up for his trial, Sir Gowan will step into his place. We have the same system today. What's it called? You get arrested, depending upon the jurisdiction, the judge lets you out on bail. A bail bondsman is someone who posts the bail for you. And if you don't show up, the bail bondsman is the one who gets in trouble. That is, has to pay. No longer does that person go stand in the dock and get thrown in jail. That person has to pay a larger fee. That is, they pay a bond for the original amount of bail. Let's say you've done something horrendous. And the amount of bail is 500000 They pay a bond, a smaller amount than that. You skip town, they're out the five hundred grand. Okay, So he was unseconded by you. You didn't stand for him. To look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage. To abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. You left him high and dry. Okay? So you left him. She finishes that idea. Northumberland. Beshrew your heart. 
shut the hell up. Fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. All right? So, why is she saying all this? Notice, notice Lady Northumberland said, do whatever you're going to do. You're not going to listen to me anyway. What is Lady Percy saying? And what would be the wrong decision? Don't go off to battle. Don't go off to battle. What does she advise? Go to Scotland. That is, leave England. Go to Scotland. You'll be safe there. Okay? Let them try themselves. Let the other rebels fight first. So did your son. He was so suffered. So came I a widow, and never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance of mine eyes, that it may grow as about as high as heaven for recordation to my noble husband. That is, no amount of tears I have will do what? Bring my husband back. She's essentially saying, don't make me weep twice by losing a husband and a father. Okay? Skip to four. Other, well, one little comment, meant to be funny by Falstaff, 2 4, line 49. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. What does that mean? If you're halting, what does it, it mean? You're walking with a limp, you're lame. If you serve bravely in battle, what does Falstaff say? You win for your bravery. Wounds. What's his point? Better not to fight. Notice this comes after what? <laughs> after Lady Percy tells her father-in-law, run. Don't fight for your honor, because what will your honor get you? Wounds or death, okay? Um, towards the end of that scene, Pito tells the prince, 355 and following, the king your father's at Westminster. There are 20 weak and wearied posts come from the north. That is, messages have come. And as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking everyone for Sir John Falstaff. Falstaff, uh, Prince goes on and says, I'm to blame, etc., etc. Okay? So, things are starting to come to a head. John of Lancaster, the Prince's younger brother, and Westmoreland have marched those troops to the north. They're going to take on Northumberland's forces. So they think, at least. 3-1. King comes in, in his nightgown, along with a page. He sends the page off, and the king gets a long soliloquy. <clears throat> How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep. Oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse. How have I frighted thee, that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? What's he telling us? He can't sleep. And when he does sleep, what? Say that again? Plagued. It's not a restful sleep. It's, it's his mind's working. Why rather, sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night life to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody? Okay, what he's talking about there is the king's chamber. 
Uh, you can't go into the king's bedchamber in Buckingham Palace, but you can at Hampton Court. You can see where uh, Henry VIII and before him, Cardinal Wolsey, because Wolsey originally built uh, built Hampton Court until, and then Henry VIII took it after he killed him. Um, and you can see the king's bed. It's huge. And it's got like six inch thick posts. I'm, when I say it's huge, it's like literally eight feet long and five feet wide. I mean, it's massive, okay? But then again, when Henry died, he was massive, okay? That's what he's talking about. And the room's perfumed, and there's music playing to lull him to sleep, you know? He says, why do people sleeping in smoky rooms on two small pallets sleep so suddenly, and yet I don't? Oh, thou dull God, why liest thou with the vile and loathsome beds and leavest the kingly couch a watch case or a common alarm bell? Alarm bell. Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes? That is, the boy who's up in the crow's nest? Will you lull him to sleep? and rock his brains and cradle of the rude and furious surge. And in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes. Now, Shakespeare is probably talking about accounts of boys in the crow's nest falling asleep during storms because they've been on watch so long. We do know Shakespeare read some accounts of sea voyages. Assuming we get to the Tempest, it's pretty clear Shakespeare knew about an account to the Bermuda, uh, either Bermuda or Bahamas Islands. That was a shipwreck, okay? Possibly referred to in both Twelfth Night and the Tempest. Canst thou, O partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy low lie down. What's the happy low? Low born, calm nurse. Sleep well. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Now that's kind of a warning. Don't be eager for power. Why? It comes with a lot of headaches. Read Oedipus's, uh, excuse me, Sophocles, Oedipus, excuse me. Yeah, Oedipus the king. Oedipus accuses his Uncle slash brother-in-law, always get all the incest relationships mixed up, accuses him of wanting the crown, of wanting the kingship. And Crayon, the uncle slash brother-in-law, is like, dude, why would I want the crown? You've got all the headaches. I get to fly Air Force One all the time. I get all the perks of the presidency without having to deal with Congress or the press, you know? That's what he's saying. Warwick comes in. And they address the king and such. And the king's asking, what's the news and such? Have you read the letters I sent you? Warwick says, yes, king. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom. That is, you perceive the state of our body. That is the health. How foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. Okay? Rank diseases. What's the worst disease a kingdom can suffer, be infected by? We're talking metaphor, obviously. Civil war. Right? A house divided against itself cannot stand. Warwick, 
It is but as a body yet distempered, which to its former strength may be restored. That is, it's a body that's sick now, but it can be restored to health. How will a body full of rebellion, infection, be restored? You have to purge the infection. Go from metaphor to reality. Kill the rebels. With, no, it's not just that, but that's a large part of it. With good advice and little medicine, my Lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. What does that mean by cooled? <laughs> Probably means dead. Okay? You don't have a footnote there, do you? No. So, King. Oh, God. That one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent weary of solid firmness melt itself into the sea and other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances, mocks, and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. Almost all of the images that he describes there, I never, I never thought about it till just now. Those are images from the book of Revelation. Or they're similar to the mountains will be made low, the valleys will rise, the seas will overflow their boundaries. If this were seen, that is, all that is referring to what? If we could read the book of fate. If we knew what was going to happen tomorrow. Or let's, let's, take, let's jump to our time period. If we knew what was going to happen, hold on a second. On November 5th, elections. If we knew what November 7th brought, some people, I think a lot of people, would change the way they're acting now. Because presidential elections kind of have a ripple effect on everything else in life. He says, if this were seen, the happiest youth viewing this progress through, what perils pass, what crosses to ensue, what difficulties are coming, if you knew what they were ahead of time, would shut the book and sit him down and die. It's one of the reasons, by the way, all time travel stories fail. It's why, it's why the play Oedipus the King, in one sense, fails. If there is such a thing as fate, and we could know what it was, we couldn't just sit down and die, could we? Unless that is what we are fated to do. All right? But he's saying, if someone knew all those details, what would they do? They would just stop right now. Because even the person with the quote-unquote most blessed life still has what in that life? There's still suffering. There's still sorrows. And then he goes back to history. Notice, looking forward in time, going backwards in time. Tis not 10 years gone since Richard and Northumberland's great friends did feast together. And in two years after were they at war. King hasn't been king for 10 years. It is but eight years since this person <laughs> was the man nearest my soul. Why? Because eight years ago, Percy Northumberland helped me become king. Bolingbroke could not have become Henry IV without the aid of Northumberland. who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot, yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which of you was by? That is, which of you was here then? And he looks at Warwick and says, you, as I remember, as I may remember, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and raided by Northumberland, did speak these words 
now proved a prophecy. And he's going to quote Richard. Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Thrones up here. Northumberland is the ladder that Bolingbroke did what? Climbed up and over. Though then, God knows I had no such intent. Is he lying or is he speaking the truth? Can't tell. If this were a soliloquy, it would mean what? He's speaking the truth. But it's not a soliloquy. Does he need to persuade these others? Yeah, maybe. But Warwick was there. But that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. It's a beautiful line when you think about it. I and greatness were compelled, forced to kiss. What does he mean by greatness? It means the crown. He's saying, I didn't seek it out. The time shall come, thus did he follow it. The time will come that foul sin gathering head that is growing, coming to its conclusion, shall break into corruption. Notice, foul sin, gathering head, growing, becoming larger, shall break into corruption. It will open like a festering wound. That wound will, and goo will come out. Foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. In other words, if you come wrongly by the kingship, what's going to happen? Bad things. Okay? This is important because he's going to have a conversation with Hal. I can't remember if it's in Act 3 or Act 4. And he's going to talk about the kingship and how Hal's kingship as Henry V will be different than Henry IV, okay? So, Warwick. There is a history in all men's lives, figuring the nature of the times deceased, figuring, appearing like the past. It's almost, almost, I'm not saying it is, but it's almost like saying history does what? As George Santayana said, famous American philosopher, those who forget the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. Okay? The, w <laughs> it's like angels coming. the witch observed, that is, observing the times past, a man may prophesy with a near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to light. What is the argument generally made by all of those on the side that says the United States and quote unquote Western European powers should come to Ukraine's defense? They're smaller. They're smaller than Russia. What else? So defending Ukraine is a defense against democracy or, or in favor of democracy. Okay. There's a historical parallel. That was especially made when the war first began. What happened to Ukraine is eerily similar to what Germany did not when it invaded Poland in 1939. It's what Germany did when it annexed the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia in 1938 and then later on Austria. Why did it annex the Sudetenland? It was an area of Czechoslovakia with German speakers. Why did Putin say he first, first, go back to 2014, went into Ukraine? He was protecting Russian speakers. That's why certain parts of Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia are very, you know, they're worried. They want Western aid flowing in because they have large Russian speaking populations. They know, they believe, we'll be next. Okay? 
He's saying if you can read the history of the past, it can help you do what? With a near aim, get at the main chance of things not yet come to life. In other words, you can kind of go, you know, this looks really similar to what happened then. So what did we do then to stop what happened? Well, we didn't do anything then. And the idea is, because we didn't act, Hitler thought what? I can take Poland and nobody's going to do anything. The West didn't do anything when he took Austria, all right? Or the city of Prague. Czechs didn't like it, by the way. In weak beginnings lie in treasured. Such things become the hatch and brood of time. Notice, the hatch, those eggs that were laid in the past, do what? They hatch and develop a new brood. And what happens if the brood is, the implication is, is it stomped out? Is it killed? More problems. And by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. So what's Warwick saying? Because this isn't the king, this is Warwick. Richard did prophesy. And his prophecy was, was what? Don't trust Northumberland. Why? Northumberland helped you to the kingship. What's obviously missing from Warwick's words? His prophecy for King Richard is just evidence of the preferably be false for you. It's a, was it only Northumberland that was false to Richard? No. The king had a little bit to do with that. He can't say that, obviously. So he just puts it all on Northumberland. Are these things then necessities? What's that mean? If something is, is, an, is a necessity, it is what? Need. Louder? Need. It's a need. It cannot, right? Food, water, shelter. Those are necessities. We're going to get to Lear, and Lear is going to be stripped, King Lear, is going to be stripped of all of his pomp. And one of his daughters is going to say to you, what needs you more than one person to serve you? And, re and Lear's going to say, need, wreck not the need. Man, boiled down to just himself, is nothing but a bare forked animal. In other words, we need more than just our bodies. We've got to have, what? Something to make life worth living. And for Lear, that's a bit of the pomp. Imagine if today somebody, Great Britain, Parliament passed a law and said, King Charles, you're out. You can still be king, but all the property of the crown now is England's. It now belongs to Parliament. Uh, we'll give you 30 days to get, a buck, get out of Buckingham Palace and to get out of Windsor Castle and to get out of your properties in Scotland and to get out of Cornwall because he's also the Duke of Cornwall, okay? All of it you gotta clear out. I can imagine Charles going, what? Wreck not the need, you know, I'm king. I... King, are these things then, this... must it happen this way? Is there no getting around this? Then let us meet them like necessities. So how do you meet fate? You play the role. You play the role. Shakespeare and Chaucer before him both use this phrase. You must make a virtue of necessity. That is... If it's got to happen, then do what? Then make it happen. That is, make it happen on your terms. Hamlet's going to say, if you get, uh, Polonius is going to tell his son, if you get into an argument, get into it in such a way that the person you're arguing with knows never to do that again. 
And he doesn't use argument, he uses quarrel. And quarrel can mean battle. And what he's suggesting there, you ever get into fisticuffs with somebody, beat the living daylight out of that person so that they never, ever consider fighting you again. It's the old, you know, not too old, American notion from the George W. Bush era of shock and awe. We're going to so completely demoralize with our firepower, okay? <coughs> then let us meet them like necessities. And that same word even now cries out on us. That is, it is necessary on us. What? That they say the bishop in Northumberland are 50,000 strong. We have to meet them, is his point. Warwick. Can't be. Okay, notice what the king said. They say that Northumberland and the bishop, that's Archbishop of York, have 50,000 troops. Who's the they? Is it? I mean, yes. How do the people know? Has he received dispatches? Has he received cables? You know? No. Warwick, it cannot be, my lord. Ah, rumor doth double. Everybody in here has probably played the telephone game. You whisper in what, you know, you speak in one person's ear, by the time you get to the other, it's totally unrecognizable. Rumor doth double. Like the voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. In other words, they've only got 25,000. Please, in your grace, go to bed. In other words, close your eyes, relax. We've got this. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. The powers he's already sent forth? He's led, he has sent 25,000. With Prince John and Falstaff, I know Falstaff doesn't mean anything, Prince John, Falstaff, and Westmoreland leading them. Bear in mind, Falstaff is a sir. He's Sir John Falstaff. The name, by the way, Falstaff probably indicates something that was once rigid, upright, firm, like a mighty oak that has fallen. <laughs> because now he's weak, fat, and old. 3 2 will skip. Uh, all of it? Yeah, we'll skip just about all of it. A couple other justices are brought in there. They're justices of the peace, and they're corrupt. And they're working with Falstaff, okay? <clears throat> they're not like the chief justice. 4 1. Get a little bit farther than I wanted to, or hoped to. 4 1. Archbishop of York comes in. More, Mowbray comes in, Bard, Lord Bardolph, not the one who hangs around with Hal and Falstaff, Lord Hastings and others. They're in the forest of Galtree, okay? And the archbishop says, he's received letters from Northumberland, their cold intent, line nine, their cold intent, tenor and substance thus. Before we talk about what the substance is, why are they cold? It's part of what the substance produces. Okay? In other words, they're not like weak. They're not alive. They're not warm. They're not full of heat and blood. Here's the Tenor and substance and intent of the letters he's received from Northumberland. Here doth he wish his person. He wishes he were here with us with such powers as might hold sorts with his quality, the which he could not levy. Sorry, wish I could be there, wish I could be leading my 25,000 troops, but I couldn't raise them. Levy means he could not raise the army, or an army. Whereupon, he is retired. So, because he couldn't march with us, or towards us, 
We went on vacation to Scotland and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may over live the hazard and fearful meeting of their opposite. But my prayers are with you. May God bless your, you know, your intentions. Mowbray. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground. Because hopes are where? They're floating in balloons, man. Because hopes are based on what? They're not real. Hopes are not real. They're fantasy. They're, go back to Theseus' speech, you know. They do what? They touch the ground and dash themselves to pieces. A messenger comes in with some news. Uh, there's an army out there hiding behind the woods. And I think they're about 30,000. The just proportion that we gave them out. Mowbray saying, yeah, that's kind of what our estimate was. Let us sway on and face them in the field. Archbishop. Who are their leaders? Okay, Westmoreland comes in. Westmoreland is, is one of the leaders of this army. So how can, how can he just walk into their camp? Safe passage. He's a knight. I mean, there is this noblesse oblige. You give honor to your, even to your enemy, which is why even in battle and after battle, the knights of one's enemy were to lifted up on beers and taken to the place to be buried and given proper burial. Knights were accorded those rights. The rest of us, let me put it that way, me, I'll assume you were all knights, you just get left, pillage, if I have a gold tooth it gets pulled out, you know. Westmoreland comes in. And he says, health and fair greeting from our general, the Prince, Lord John, and Duke of Lancaster, who's back there, you know, having his diapers changed, metaphorically speaking. John's going to come in, and John does not come across like a 15, 16-year-old. For one simple reason. He's been trained this way all his life. Okay? So Westmoreland speaks because the... Archbishop says, what doth concern your coming? Why are you here? And he says, if that rebellion came like itself in base and abject routes, led on by bloody youth guarded with rags and countenanced by boys and beggary, I say if damned commotion so appeared in his true native and most proper shape, you, reverend father, he's an archbishop, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honors. What's he mean? Gentlemen, this is beneath you. You should not be rebels because of your honors. He says, you, Lord Archbishop, who see, that is the city, and his cathedral seat, all right, is by a civil peace maintained. Peace is maintained in your town by the power of the state, whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched whose learning and good letters peace have tutored, whose white vestments figure innocence. That is, the archbishop should wear white, and the white is a symbolic of innocence, purity. The dove and very blessed spirit of peace. Wherefore do you so ill, I love this, translate yourself? So what do you do when you translate something? You go from one language to another. He's gone from the language of peace, divinity, purity, innocence, to out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war. 
Turn in your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine to a loud trumpet and a point of war. We could talk about it. We could go from there to today again. <coughs> My wife and I were, uh, two years ago, we were kind of moving around from one church, church to another. And we started attending a church that's um, affiliated with what's called the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. Because <coughs> we really like the, the priest there, he's a friend and such. But we had to stop. Because once Putin invaded, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church was just like, go man, go, get them all. <laughs> And in the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, when you do these prayers that are in part of the church, one of the things you do, one of the things you do, is you remember the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. That is, you offer up praise and thanks to God for his all blessedness, holy Kirill. And I told the priest, I said, I can't do it. This guy is sending thousands to their death. Ukrainian, most of the Ukrainians who are fighting against the Russians are Orthodox Christians. Most of the Russians who are fighting against the Ukrainians are Orthodox. It's just like the Crusades against Constantinople. Constantinople, they were all Christians. The Crusades weren't going and killing, quote unquote, Saracens and, you know. He's saying here, you are a, quote unquote, man of God. How dare you? Blessed are the peacemakers in the Beatitudes. Turning your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine. What? To loud trumpet and point of war. The archbishop, he gets the point. <laughs> Wherefore do I this? He throws it back. So why do you think I'm doing this? To this end, we are all diseased. And with our surfeiting and want and ours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. Old notion, you get sick, what do you do? What does the physic, the doctor, do to you? Sticks you with knives and needles and causes blood to come out. You bleed the person. Why? To get rid of the bad blood. I know, totally crazy. So he says, we have to bleed to get rid of the disease. Of which disease our late King Richard, being infected, died. Notice, he wasn't bled, so to speak. But my most noble Lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician, nor do I as an enemy to peace troop in the throng to military men, but rather show a, like, show a while like fearful war to diet rank minds, sick of happiness, and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life. Hear me more plainly. In other words, let me speak clearly. I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer. He says, I've looked at the, the balance sheet, so to speak. What are we doing? Open rebellion. Okay, he's an archbishop. He's familiar with scripture. Romans 12, whatever, talks about all government is instituted by God. We talked about when I you know, briefly discussed Richard II, the idea I had written it down here of passive obedience. You obey your Lord and King, even if he's a horrible, rotten monster, because God has put that person in power to punish you. So he says, I've weighed the rebellion against the wrongs we suffer and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. What's the point? The scales have got to get put back in balance. In other words, karma's a bitch. <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying. We see which way the stream of time doth run and are enforced from our most quiet there 
by the rough torrent of occasion. He's kind of saying, we are caught up in this flow. And it's the flow of time. Well, what has time brought them? Henry IV is king. What did time bring them before that? Richard II. He's saying we're just part of this flow of history. And part of that flow is, should Henry IV be king? No. And have the summary of all our griefs what time shall serve to show in articles which long ere this we offered to the king. That is, we have given the king what? Our Declaration of Independence. With this caveat, they haven't declared independence. Because what is the Declaration of Independence almost entirely made of? The causes for that declaration. The main body of that document is Thomas Jefferson listing all of the problems all of the griefs okay, that the colonists suffered at the hands of King George III. Why do you think the First Amendment carries with it, which is one, there are five parts of the First Amendment. Freedom of religion, freedom of the press, what else? Freedom, that's press. Yes. Which is leading to it, freedom to petition government for the redress of grievances. We have a right to do what? Protest. It's peaceful. It's too peaceably. Okay. So he says, we've given this list to the king. We are denied access unto his person. The king won't listen to us in person. Even by those men that most have done us wrong. The dangers are the days, but newly gone, whose memory is written in the earth, with yet appearing, appearing blood, the examples of every minute's instance. His point is, time marches on. We had to act. Westmoreland. When was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to great on you that you should seal this lawless bloody book of forged and rebellion, blah, 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 okay? They go back, Mowbray comes into the conversation, okay? Mowbray, little background, Mowbray is the son of the previous Duke of Norfolk. Mowbray is the last name. Duke of Norfolk is the title. This Mowbray, his father was Thomas Mowbray. All right? This is from Richard II. Thomas Mowbray was the one who challenged Henry Bolingbroke to a duel, essentially, to a joust. And it was to the death. Henry Bolingbroke, that's Henry IV. Mowbray and Bolingbroke were both banished by Richard II. Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, however, was banished for life. He could never return. All right? Bolingbroke was banished for 10 years. He did return. He became king. This Mowbray is that Mowbray's son. If you know anything about feuds, how do feuds work? If Rook and I are feuding, and we both have children, and he kills me, what happens? Feud's over? Hell no. My son's coming after you, and if he doesn't get you, he's gonna get your son. And after that, your other son is gonna come. What does that lead to? Modern day Israel and the Arabs. How far back does that feud go? I was just talking with an Egyptian guy the other day ordering our, our Egyptian food. We start talking, and I was like, it goes back to Genesis. <laughs> it's Ishmael and Isaac, the two sons of Abraham. 
there is a feud here, okay? So Westmoreland says, were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's, Norfolk's seigneuries, that is, all the properties? Restored by whom? By your noble lord. Your noble and right well-remembered fathers. Notice, your father, he's not saying with a horrible man. Henry IV, as Bolingbroke, never said Mowbray was a horrible man. They had a disagreement. You're a knight, the Middle Ages, you have a disagreement, you kill each other. <laughs> you fight to the death. It's not like, you know, let's uh, draw straws, you know, flip a coin. Mowbray, what thing and honor had my father lost that needed to be right and breathed in me? The king that loved him as the state stood then was perforce, perforce compelled to banish him. That is, Richard II banished him. And then that Henry Bolingbroke and he being mounted both roused in their seats, their named horses, but, and he talks about they were getting ready to battle, and that's when the king banished him. Westmoreland. You speak, Lord Mowbray, Mowbray, now you know not what. Son is essentially what Westmoreland is saying. You don't know what you're talking about. Westmoreland, by the way, is old. He's like Northumberland. He's the previous generation. He remembers exactly what happened. He was there. All right? This Mowbray was not. He wasn't born in England. He was born in exile. The Earl of Hefford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. That's his father. Who knows on whom fortune, blah, blah, blah. So he goes on. Here's why I'm here, line 140, one. I'm here to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace, that is the king, that he will give you audience. Uh, excuse me, John, it's not the king, it's Prince John. And wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Okay, so what's he saying? Prince John will listen to you. You will have audience with him. If your demands are just, we will meet them. What did King Henry offer the rebels in the first play? Everything. If they're just, you'll get it all. What did uh, drawing a blank on the names? What did the two not tell Hotspur? Vernon and Worcester. What did they not tell Hotspur? Well, I think they offered peace. No, if we offer it, if we tell him that, he'll take it. Why? Because Hotspur is honorable. And Hotspur believes the king is honorable. And honorable men stay true to their words. Okay? So, Miss o uh, Westmoreland says, I'm making you this offer for mercy, not for. We're not. We don't fear fighting you guys. We'll slaughter you. This is an act of mercy, okay? Hastings says, does the prince have this authority? Does he have full commission in very ample virtue of his father? Westmoreland, yes. <laughs> Notice, that is intended in the general's name. It's kind of like Prince John is... Um, what was Dwight D. Eisenhower's title in the Second World War? Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces. In other words, Eisenhower didn't have to get approval from anybody else. It was his decisions what to do on the battlefield. Westmoreland is saying Prince John has that authority. Okay, cool. Mowbray, after Westmoreland leaves, I know we've only got like a minute left, two minutes left. Mowbray says 184. 183. There is a thing within my bosom tells me no conditions of our peace can stand. It's a fancy way of saying what? I don't care what happens. I'm not going to be I don't trust them. That's it. Okay? Um, 
kind of jumped to the end. Should have listened to Mowbray. Okay. 4-2, very, very quickly. We have Prince John with an audience, or audiencing, if you want, the traitors. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle Lord Archbishop. And so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. In other words, ta-da, you know. I love you all as friends. And so he offers all these kind words and such. And Hastings says, even if we die here, that is, if we go ahead and fight, he says, 45 and following, we have supplies to second our attempt. That is, we've got more standing in the wings. You might think you can whip us, Prince John. Stop. You are too shallow to sound the bottom of the after times, meaning you know better than to think you know what will happen tomorrow. Okay? So, Westmoreland asks the king, or tells the, the prince, Pleaseth your grace, answer them directly, how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all. In other words, your complaints, done. I agree. All of your griefs, they will be resolved. Let's shake on it. They essentially shake on it. And they agree to disperse their troops. Okay? We will pick up um, Act 4, C2, around line uh, 60. Well, we'll pick up here, line 54, on Tuesday. Which means we will definitely finish Henry IV, Part 2, on Tuesday and start. Hamlet. I think we'll be able to start Hamlet. We'll probably only get into about the first 15, 20 lines. <laughs> Hamlet. I've literally taken, I think, uh, in my other courses, like eight class periods for just Hamlet. It's, those are hour-long class periods. It's packed. But we're going to do it much more quickly than that. All right. Have a good weekend.